Hello. I will try to give here a brief, no, no idea how brief, but I kind of walk through the code base of Graal in H as it uh, currently stands, kind of how it works in general, what it does, and the details will get outdated um, pretty soon probably, but hopefully the general idea is kind of uh, helpful and I'm streaming this right now but I will put the recording on YouTube later as well. If you have questions right now you can put them in the Twitch chat and later maybe I will try to look at the YouTube comments as well but it's probably better to reach me uh, somewhere else if you want a quick reply. Um, but if you wanted to try out this project yourself you would clone it from GitHub and then export some uh, a suitable Java home like user lib jvm java 11 graal vm it needs to be this special version of java at least i think um, there's probably ways to make it work under a stock java as well but right now i haven't looked into that so we want to do something like this and uh, where do you get this kind of installation from if you're on arch linux you can do this by installing the um, this package, JDK 11 GraalVM bin from the Arch user repository using your favorite helper. If you're on any other operating system, then I think some kind of official or unofficial package or just downloading the JDK from Oracle directly, something like that should work to give you this uh, GraalVM image. And then you tell the shell that's the Java home and then you can run something like may even clean test and if you do that for the first time it's going to download a bunch of things and here it's not going to do that but we're cleaning everything it runs a bunch of tests everything works hooray so it did some control flow stuff some buildings some python code was skipped uh, because that doesn't work yet some javascript tests were run four of them um and the basic principle in which this um, any language written for this GraalVM runtime works is that you basically write an interpreter for the language and then Graal does a lot of magic to turn that interpreter into actually uh, compiled code which runs very fast. Um, so what we do is we first um, we have some kind of entry point which starts with, let's close all of this, the parser, which is buried in here. And uh, parsing this language is relatively simple. It's a JSON. So we use some JSON library at the moment. I think it's a Google JSON library. I'm sure it can be something else. Um, and then we check out, is it a JSON object? Then we parse it as a JSON object. Then we look uh, what's the type of this JSON object? And I just have a class where I put all these constants like a Z object type is the Z1 K1 key. And then I can compare that to the function call constant or the function constants, for instance. If it's a function call, which is Z7, then we parse it in a special way. And parsing it as a function call, um, it parses the function which is being referenced, which is the function call function key. Um, parses that into an ast node. Um, if that's a reference literal, so if it says uh, like execute the z31 function or whatever, then we also have a function name which is convenient. And then we look for arguments. So in uh, this an H language or a Z language, we still need to figure that out. A function call is basically uh, z1k1. The type is z7. The function that you call is z7k1, uh, which is, let's say, I don't know, z35. And then the arguments of that function call you specify as either k1, x, k2, y, and so on. Or you do that as um, z35k1, z35k2, and so on, with that function name, which is why we get the function name up here. So now we just look for arguments, and as long as uh, k1, k2, and so on is in the J JSON object. We parse whatever is in there and then add it to the list of arguments. Uh, what is this? Right, if it's um, if the function is if, then we do something special um, because 
conceptually if is a normal function call, but we want to do special things with it. But then we return an ast node. And uh, let's start with something simpler. Uh, if we parse a list literal, for instance, if we have parse what's a JSON array, then we return a list literal node, which contains a bunch of child asked nodes, uh, which we parse recursively. It's a pretty simple parser so far. And then the node looks like this. It extends a basic node class, which I think extends an even more basic node class. Yeah, so we have Z node, and then there's node up here. And it has a bunch of children nodes, and this children annotation tells the uh, framework, which is called truffle, that these are child nodes of our node. And I'm not sure what consequences that has, but it's important for some reason. And if you forget this, then you will get uh, strange errors. And eventually you just learn that some kinds of error message mean that you forgot a child or children um, annotation somewhere. And the important thing is that it needs to have an execute function, or in this case, we actually have an execute that list function. I'm not sure if we need that. Maybe I'll get rid of it eventually. Uh, and the important part is that we have all of our child nodes. Uh, we build an array with the correct results. We execute each child node. So just like the execute function we are currently running, we execute all the child nodes as well. The virtual frame in theory tells us where um, argument references can come from and so on. Uh, we put all that in the array. And then because the linked list representation we use at runtime is no, the list representation we use at runtime is a linked list. We uh, then go backwards, starting with the nil singleton, uh, build new these kind of uh, cons nodes, like in a Lisp list. And then we return this. So we have this kind of ast node class. And then corresponding to that, we also have a runtime object, which is this Z list. And those are kind of the two general kinds of objects. And right now they're here in two packages. And this font size is probably too small to be readable. Um, we have one package with a bunch of nodes. We have one package with a bunch of, well, less of them, but some runtime objects. There's a list in there. Um, we have a parser package with, with exactly one class in it and some built-ins, which I guess we will get to later. And so that's the very basic flow of execution that you have these ast nodes, all of which implement an execute method. And they can do clever things like this uh, compiler asserts, compilation constants here. This tells the Graal virtual machine that actually the length of the nodes is a compile time con constant value. So what it is allowed to do is explode this loop. And we've told it that it should explode this loop because this loop is only dependent on like this zero is the starting point. That's a constant nodes of length we've claimed is a constant. And so it can unroll this loop or they call the annotation explode loop instead of unroll loop for some reason. And then you get more efficient code at runtime. Uh, and down here, it's the same thing. And I think, no, there's no good example for this right here. So I should maybe say a few words about uh, Graal, VM, and Truffle. So Truffle is the kind of library or all the APIs that we use. This um, node class here comes from Truffle. This um, ex children annotation comes from Truffle. I think this explode loop comes from Truffle as well. Yeah. So all these APIs come from Truffle, but Truffle is some generic Java library. I think you could run all of this under a normal Java virtual machine. Probably right now for Graal NH, it doesn't quite work because I didn't. Uh, sorry, my headphones beeped for some reason, but I think they're still rolling. Let me check. Yeah, there's still some sound in OBS. Um, so Truffle is this more general API or library which we could run under any language. And then Graal VM is a special version of the Java virtual machine, which knows about all the truffle tricks and it knows um, how to take advantage of them to compile this language interpreter into efficient code at runtime. So 
Uh, in Truffle itself, these asserts here do, I think, pretty much nothing. Um, whatever this is. But then, uh, when this, when the same code here runs under this Growl VM virtual machine, then um, it takes advantage of all these hints and special Truffle annotations and turns this regular interpreter, which you can run under any JVM, into a very fast language runtime. And maybe we can look at the list class next, because um, for some part it's a regular Java class, like we have here a singleton field is nil, which and we have other private fields here, the head, tail, and we also cache the length of the list for efficiency. So the nil private constructor sets the head and tail to null and the length to zero, or a list can have a head and another list as a tail. Um, but what it also does is this export message business down here, which is another truffle thing. So we say that this class in exports this interop library, and then it exports all these messages which belong to that library. And this lets code from other languages which are implemented using GraalVM work with this object. So because I implement these messages uh, has array elements, yes, it, so it's treated like an array for other languages. We can read an array element with the given index. Um, if the index is zero, we return the head element. Otherwise we read the index minus one element of the tail. So we go through. Um, we can get the array size, which is the length, which is why we cache the length, because we need it all the time, even though it, we could, in theory, get it just from um, the... We could do something like uh, if tail equals null, then the length is zero, otherwise one plus tail get array size. This would work just as well, it would just take longer, and for efficiency we want to cache the length. Um, we also export a message which is unrelated to all the array stuff, which is this is null, because right now I'm saying that this nil singleton, which forms the end of this linked list, is also equivalent to a null object in other languages, like the null in Java or the none in Python and so on. I'm not yet sure if this is actually correct, because there's also, I think there's a to-do comment here, uh, or is it here? Oops. Yeah, it's here. So Z Z13 is the nil value, but in H also has Z23, which is the nothing value, and I'm not yet sure what the difference is. Um, I think nothing is mainly the opposite of everything, which is uh, everything is the list of all the objects that are defined, I think. So basically everything is the equivalent of doing abstract text and age data of this. It gives you the list of all of these IDs, I think, is what everything does, and then nothing is the opposite of that, as far as I'm aware, but I'm not yet sure, and maybe it would be more correct to map this nothing to null instead of nil, or to say that both of them are nil. I think there are some um, Graal truffle languages which have more than one kind of null-ish value, and then, then they say all of these values can look like null to other languages. Basically, the upshot of all this export message business is that if I run some um, Python code and I tell that Python code to evaluate a snippet in the in this NH language or Z language, then when that returns a list, it looks like a native list to Python and it can be printed like a native list, uh, which is pretty nice. Okay, Danny isn't sure if... Uh, what the difference between null and nothing is, I guess. Well, we'll find out about that, I'm sure. It's still all in development. Uh, so that's the list object. And since we've talked about export library, maybe we can look at the function next. Um, oops. I didn't plan to make any changes there, so let me just undo whatever I did. Oh yeah, that. 
Okay, Z30 nil is meant to be only the end of a Z10 list. Okay, Z23 nothing is meant to be more like null or undefined. Then I should uh, write that down and fix it. Thank you. Then he says Z30 nil is for lists and Z is more like null. Update accordingly. I like that because otherwise um, you don't have. There's no difference between null and the empty list, which is kind of which is how it is in Lisp, but it's kind of weird in other languages. And I think with the Python interop, I already noticed that this looked strange. So I will update this later, or maybe I'll do it in the stream, and then we can see how that works. But let's look at functions for a little bit. Um, okay, there we go. So a function is created when you evaluate a function node and in an age, a function doesn't just have one function body or something like that. It has a list of implementations or I think um, there's some uh, discussion still about that if it should be that the function lists its implementations or that the f implementations are more independent and they can say I belong to this function but the function doesn't have to know about all of its implementations or something like that. But right now, at least the way I invented it here, is that a function directly has a list of implementations which you get out of implementation nodes and then it has an index into which implementation should currently be used and if you do it the smart way, then you've probably profiled all the functions and uh, you know which one is fastest and you use that. And I think that's what the um, standard NH does. And I don't yet have a good name for that either because it's just called NH, but NH is also kind of the language that I'm implementing. So sometimes I say standard NH or upstream NH or the JavaScript NH, something like that. So that NH does some clever profiling of all the functions, all the implementations. Uh, which is something you have to set up after you clone the repository for the first time and I don't have anything like that yet because I only have like a handful of functions that work at all. So right now the implementation starts at zero and if an implementation is found to be unusable, which happens if it throws a special exception called an unusable implementation exception. Uh, where is that here? If the exception if the implementation throws this to say, hey, I can't actually be used, for instance, because it's a code implementation in Python or some other language that we don't support yet, then we go ahead to the next implementation and we keep a list of all the implementations that can't be used yet. And we just hope that every function has at least one usable implementation. Sorry, my headphones decided to turn themselves off there. Uh, let me see if I can prevent this. Uh, okay, hopefully that will be enough. Yeah, and to actually execute a function, um, so maybe I should quickly go to a function call node. So we're back in the ast node territory now and a function call node has a node for the function and an area of nodes for the arguments that it uses. And we'll skip this for a second. And then to execute it, you first execute the function. So you turn the function node into this function runtime object. You also execute all the arguments and collect them into a list of arguments and you again mark this loop as being unrollable and then what you do you don't do anything special with the function you see here we haven't even said that the function is a z function or anything uh, it's actually very generic we tell this library which is the uh, interop library i think we would like to execute this function with these arguments and what we've also done in z function is we've said we export the interop library and one of the messages we export is uh, where is it? Down here, this execute message. And so it's actually a 
very loose kind of coupling. We don't directly say a function call a Z function call node calls a Z function. It calls any object. And in practice right now, that's going to be a Z function at runtime, but it could also be any other runtime value. It could be a function from another language. And then the Z function tells uh, Truffle or GraalVM, one of the two, uh, I can be executed. Here's how I am executed. Here's what you should do if anyone wants to execute me. And this could be a function call from a Z function call node. It could also be a function call from some other language. And I think through some kind of a magic, the Truffle and GraalVM languages or libraries or whatever managed to make this very efficient again. But it's kind of interesting, and in I didn't expect this at all at first. That this is how it's done, but this is how the execution looks in the simple language, at least, which is this kind of example language that the GraalVM people publish and that you're supposed to look at if you want to know how to write your own language. And by now, it's not really the simplest of languages anymore, but it's a pretty good model still to look at. And so it took me a while to figure out that this was how function execution worked there, because I didn't find any connection between their function call node and their functions, but that's how it works. The function call node calls anything that's callable through this interop library, and then the callable objects declare themselves to be callable or executable, like this. And the message is also exported in this special way. It's not a normal method like here, for instance, where we say, is this executable? Yes, always, unconditionally. Uh, instead, this is done through a static class, and then it has this speci uh, specialization business, which I don't fully understand yet, but apparently this is kind of one of the big things through which um, Truffle and GraalVM can achieve really efficient execution, which is the specializations uh, that kind of rewrite the syntax tree, I guess, or something, um, depending on runtime behavior of the program, I guess. I'm not making a lot of sense. But I think from my point of view as a language implementer, I'm defining two strategies to implement execution. And the more basic one is down here, do indirect, I think, where we get the function with which we are... Um, so th this is the instance of the outer class. So that's the Z function here on which this execute method is called. And we get it as the first argument because execute is uh, this separate class. Um, and we get the arguments with which the function is called. And then there's an extra thing, which is this cached indirect call node. And at cached is some other truffle annotation that I'm not even sure what it does, but somehow it creates this indirect call node for us. And then we ask this call node, hello, we would like to call the function or specifically the call target of the function with these arguments. Um, and then this basic version of execution can also be specialized with a whole bunch of conditions um, because apparently this um, indirect call node here is pretty inefficient in general. And if you can turn that into a direct call node instead, you get much more efficient execution. And I'm not sure why, but I think this has something to do with allowing the compiler to inline the function code across the function call. Um, but for that, to be possible, it's necessary that the function that you want to call is actually always the same. And this is, I think, what all these annotations are for. So you have the same Z function, you have the same arguments. And then, oops, instead of the cached indirect call node down here, you now have this direct call node. And I think this tells uh, Truffle how to create this. And I have no idea what this create refers to, but it's something I copy pasted. There's also an assumption that the call target is stable. And 
uh, the call target itself. Um, and the call target is what the function has. So each uh, each implementation corresponds to one call target. And you can see the way we get the call target is we get the current implementation. And then we get the call target from that. Um, and as long as the call target is the same, we can reuse this direct call node or something. And uh, it's probably really obvious that I don't fully understand this, but this assumption is also part of the picture because apparently assumptions are how you transfer from optimized code back to unoptimized code, how you de-optimize when necessary. And I first heard of this like general de-optimization concept uh, years ago, and it blew my mind that this is what Java does, and I assume probably other runtimes as well. Like uh, you assume that a call to a certain method is always going to the same method because the class that you're calling it on doesn't have any subclasses, and so you don't need to do this virtual function lookup of finding out which method exactly am I actually calling. And then if any class gets loaded, um, if any subclass gets loaded, which also defines this method, then you have to de-optimize because you assumed that there weren't any um, other versions of this method that you had to look for. And now that this assumption is no longer valid, you have to de-optimize your code and actually do this lookup in the function table of the object you're calling or something like that. Um, I'm probably not making a lot of sense here, but basically these truffle assumptions here are the mechanism to let your implementation take advantage of that. And so we have this assumption which is used here, and I think it's, yeah, it's here. The call target is stable assumption is used for this specialization, which truffle does something with. And where does this assumption come from? It comes from the call target stable assumption. And what we have to do is if we ever change the implementation like here, if we set a different implementation index, then we have to invalidate this assumption. And this lets Truffle or Graal VM, I'm not sure which one, uh, lets, opt lets them optimize this function call down here as if it's always going to go to the same implementation of this function. And it's always going to be a direct call. And you can inline the code across this function call boundary and everything. And if this is ever not the case, um, then we as a language implementation have to make sure that we don't change that invariant without also uh, invalidating this assumption, which we do here. And when this assumption is invalidated, then it's um, Truffle or GraalVM's responsibility to keep track of all the optimizations that were based on this assumption, like this execute down here, where we said this relies on that assumption and to um, de-optimize them or de-specialize them or something. And that's basically my very <laughs> confused overview of this uh, specialization business, which I still don't fully understand, but which as far as I'm aware is extremely critical to, um, to the performance of these languages that you implement. And as far as I understand, it's uh, hugely more convenient to do it like this with these annotations than doing the equivalent thing by hand. You can basically define a bunch of specializations for an operation um, and some more or less magic from Truffle will take care that um, the best specialization is being used or if necessary, it will fall back to a different specialization and so on. But I think I've talked enough about this area of the code that I don't understand. Sorry. Maybe I should try talking about something that I do understand. Um, maybe where these implementations come from. Um, yeah, so a function 
node has a bunch of implementation nodes as children and the execution is very straightforward oops um, loop through all the implementations uh, execute them and return a function with that array of implementations and the implementations can be several different kinds of implementation which is somewhere in the JSON parser so the parser checks the type of the JSON object and it can be uh, built in or it can be a code implementation and the default or the third kind of implementation as far as I know that an age has which is um, a regular function call I haven't implemented yet um, hopefully soon but a built-in is an implementation that basically you as the uh, so growl in age or the upstream in age or whatever you know how to implement this and um, so the function definition just has kind of a reminder hey I want to use a built-in here you know how to execute this function right and right now there's two built-ins there's the value built-in and then there's the head built-in value gives you kind of the value version of an object so for instance if your object has a permanent ID and it has labels and descriptions then it uh, throws all of that away and gives you the more kind of pure value version and right in in age in growl in age the value value built in doesn't do very much if if the value is a string so a val it's a value or kind of JSON object of type string then it just returns the value of the string as a string as a Java plain string instead of this uh, Z object class and then it doesn't do anything else yet so what should go here is this uh, throwing away of the ID and the labels and so on and I have not done that yet and I need to do that and the head built in is um, should give you the first element of a list uh, so this head is should what it should return and we actually do that with the interop library so the that list implements this interop protocol and says to read the indexed element you return if the index is zero you return the head otherwise you go through the tail so you can read an array element like that and the head built in asks the interop library for the zeroth element of the value so this can actually be any array like value so this built-in will work the same way also for a Java array or a Python list if it's passed in here that said I am sure we could use this as specialization thing for something like um, at specialization public object get head of set list of set list value and we still have a uh, no in that case we wouldn't need an interop library we could just return value dot head okay it's not public but get head uh, I would add something like that here public object get head assert this not equals nil return head and I'm not sure if this should be an assert or a better error handling but then we could do this and to do that um, error handling and I would probably need to add a few more um, bits here um, but the basic idea of this specialization business is that now truffle could automatically call this method which might be more efficient if the value is a set list and if it's found at runtime not to be a set list then it can fall back to this more general implementation up here and I'm just curious let me see if this works or not it probably doesn't nope it doesn't uh, cannot find symbol uh -huh. specialization is not reachable it is shadowed by is the order significant The order is significant, aha. Uh -huh. 
And the tests even passed. Wow. I did not quite expect that. That's nice. Okay. So now we have what might be a more efficient implementation of the head built in. And I have no idea if it actually is more efficient. Um, but apparently that's how simple these specializations are. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I was expecting to have to write something like replaces, as I think. Yeah, replaces get head of set list is something you can write, and I'm not sure what it means, but apparently right now at least it's simply not necessary. Cool. Um, actually, let me just see system out print print line. I am the special implementation e. because I'm not sure if it's actually being used or not. Let's run the tests again. Yeah, okay. Wait. Wait, hang on. Ex excuse me. I have a to do error handling here, and I have a test for the error behavior, so. <laughs> what? Um. So the test is here, uh, head of single element list, it's a function call with this list and with this list, and then it's a function call with the empty list, and it expects to throw an exception. I am confused how this test still passes when the head built-in implementation down here has this invalid array index exception and then throws a correct error exception and this just does nothing. Um, system error print line E. Okay, what right, was this? Oh yeah, this assertion. Right, because in the test assertions are enabled. Is that why? Let's see if I comment this out. No, it still works. So it throws a polyglot exception with an assertion error. Post condition contract violation for receiver set function and return value null. Yeah, okay. So maybe previously it was the assert, but here I think the problem is that we return null from the uh, from what from the z function call or something, and we're not supposed to do that um, because Truffle doesn't like the primitive Java null. And so Truffle throws an assertion at some point, and I guess the test is just at this point still very unspecific, and this counts as a guest exception somehow, and we are not yet asserting that this test actually is this correct test, uh, this correct error that the list is nil. Um, so I guess it accidentally still works. Um, so if I put this assert back in, then we are probably going to see that change, yeah. yeah. So this was basically where I got lazy earlier today and didn't yet want to uh, fully implement the error handling. Yeah, so now it's a different error. It's this assertion error in the ZList class, which is thrown as a polyglot exception, and I guess it satisfies this test here as well and there's no check yet that the uh, guest object of the exception i think would have to be then this um correct list is nil error with which has an id z 400 or z 500 and something which i don't have yet 
And I guess that's why the test is too unspecific to catch that this implementation doesn't do any error handling. Okay. Um, do I want to look at anything else? Or should I just try to code a bit? Like we can br briefly look at the tests while we're here. So basically they all extend this Z test function where I uh, set up a context, um, which is what lets us build code. And then there's a, an eval function, which turns the code that we have, which is just a bunch of JSON, turns that into a truffle source in this special language. And then it asks the truffle context, would you please evaluate this source? And that returns a truffle value. And then the tests, um, so they call eval with that string, and then treat this truffle value as a string most of the time. I think some of the primitive tests do something different. Yeah, this one checks, is the evaluated value null? Is it, or if it's a Boolean, is it true, is it false? So for now, all of the tests are built around this um, eval helper in the general Z test. And I just basically write a bunch of uh, JSON by hand and it doesn't look very nice and it's not very readable and eventually I should come up with something better or directly use the tests from NH because in NH each function can also declare tests for itself and really I should at least be running all of those in addition to whatever tests I define myself here. Um, but I don't think I'm uh, far enough for that yet. So right now it's a bunch of JSON literals in Java string literals, which is annoying because you have to backslash all the double quotes, but that's what it is for now. And the code JS test, for instance, returns uh, functions at eight with the implementations. It has exactly one implementation, um, which is code in the language JavaScript. And then the code that's being run is this um, where Z53, K1 and K2 refers to the two parameters of the function and K0 is the return value. And then we call this implementation in a function call with some booleans and check that the result is the right one. And this um, code implementation is pretty fun to evaluate. So we, to get the call target for this, we build this string, which we have into a new source segment in Truffle. And then we ask the context, which is basically the Z context is a container for various utility stuff, which we pass into our um, nodes. Where is it? No. no, we don't pass the context into our nodes at all. We look it up from wherever the asked node is being mounted. We ask the context, can you please parse this source code with the following parameter names so that it knows that if we later call this code with two arguments, then within the code, these two identifiers should refer to those arguments. And this gives us something called a call target, which is another special truffle type. And then we can call this call target and it's going to end up calling into the Graal.js implementation, which is a full JavaScript implementation in this Truffle Graal VM world. And it's going to run all the code for us and return a value. And we actually have to tweak the code just a little bit um, by saying that we want to return K0 and also declare K0 up here. So we surround the real code with that. And then we get a value back out of that. And so far I've only tested this with Booleans, which map pretty cleanly between JavaScript and uh, our own language. So that all works out pretty well. 
And we could do almost the same thing with Python, except the Graal Python implementation is not as advanced and it doesn't seem to support this argument names thing yet. So if we run any Graal Python code, it will just erase a, what is it called? I don't remember. A name error is what we will get because this Z53K1 parameter hasn't been defined. Um, oh, you can also see down here there's uh, what I called extremely obvious hard coding um, because this is the general implementation code node, but right now I've just hard coded the two parameter names Z53, K1, and K2 in there. And in reality, of course, uh, the parser would need to keep track which function does this implementation belong to, um, what is the name, and how many parameters does it have, k1, k2, and so on. And then it would have to pass it through into here, and then instead of hard coding the two names here, that would go there, and then I could use this for every function, but right now it's very, very hard coded in here, because that was enough to make the simple tests pass. Um, and if the source code is something we don't support, like if the language is Python, we set the source to zero, uh, to null. And this then means that eventually we will have to throw an exception, but we shouldn't throw an exception when the implementation code node is being evaluated. We should only throw an exception when this when the implementation that results is itself called. So the implementation has a call target and that call target is what should then throw an exception eventually. And it should throw this uh, unusable implementation exception, which we saw earlier somewhere over in Z function, because when Z function sees this unusable implementation exception, it knows I need to mark the current implementation as unusable and switch to a different implementation. And so this doesn't directly throw this exception because that should only happen later. Instead, it creates an ast node, which throws that, which will just throw that exception when it's evaluated. So that's this z throw constant node. It's extremely simple, has a constructor, and the execute method throws this exception. Then we wrap this ast node into a root node because in Truffle, apparently not there's a difference between nodes and root nodes, and I'm not sure what it is, um, but we wrap it in a root node, and a root node is supposed to have a language here, and right now I have no idea where to get the language from, so it's null and it works out so far. And once we have a root node, Truffle lets us turn that into a call target, and that is then something that can be called in a function call, and then it will immediately throw this unusable implementation exception and then the function will know that it has to switch to a different implementation. Uh, for instance, switch from the Python code implementation to the JavaScript code implementation or uh, whatever else. Yeah. Um, maybe one other thing is the evaluation of references. So a reference to a certain uh, Z object is um, right, a reference literal node doesn't do that yet. That was something that wasn't clear to me for a while, but how it works right now is if you have a reference literal node in the syntax tree somewhere, then as a special case, if the if it's a reference to true or false or nil, then we return those values. And otherwise we return a Z reference runtime object. And then eventually a reference has to be evaluated. And we do that by saying that a reference is a function with zero parameters because in NH there aren't any real function with zero parameters because functions are supposed to be um, pure and free of side effects and return the same result for the same arguments. So why would you have a function with zero arguments that would just always return the same thing? So we say a reference is a function with zero arguments and if you execute it, um, 
then we do something which is pretty ugly. Um, we have this global registry, which is a map from string to objects, uh, which is static to this class. If we've already seen this key, then we return it from the registry. Otherwise, we read the JSON for this key from the abstract text uh, Git repository. We tell the parser to parse this into a node. We execute this node. We put the result into the registry and then we return that. And this is terrible because we have here a node that we just conjured out of thin air and it's not really linked to the rest of the syntax tree anywhere. And this worked so far, but I already noticed in some other experiments that this just ends up throwing exceptions when you try to evaluate a code node, for instance, because um, so if in the code that this reference loads from disk, if in there there's an implementation code node, then this will try to look up a context reference from the current syntax tree by just walking up the syntax tree, uh, walking up the parent nodes, uh, so that it can ask this context to please uh, parse this uh, code. And this will end up throwing an exception because here we've created this node which is completely unconnected to the syntax tree and there's nowhere to get a context from. And so I already tried to fix this. I think that must have been a week ago or so. So that's just a work in progress branch here. Um, oh, right, I have some unstaged changes. Uh, head, whip, head specialization. And there's this whip branch, which I committed. Oh, I committed that on June 13th. I'm not sure if that Saturday was also the day I tried to work on this or if it was, I think that was even earlier. Um, but that was when I tried to implement this third type of implementation, which is a function call. And for that, I noticed that references can't be evaluated the way they're currently evaluated. So uh, let's just check that out. Uh, we did already. So now this looks completely different. And it's a lot more like a code node. So like in a code node, we have a context. We build a new source code, but instead of building this source code from just a string literal, we build it from a certain file. And then we ask the context, can you please parse this source code, which in this case is in our own language, into a call target. And then we immediately call the call target and put the result in the registry. And this context.getTruffle file function, um, come on, set context. There we go. This asks the environment, whatever this is. This is basically copy pasted from simple language. Uh, we would like to have an internal truffle file with this path. And right now this just assumes that somewhere below the current working directory, directly at the current working directory, you have this abstract text git repository cloned and then inside there in age data, the zid.json, that's the file we want to load. And that gets you a call target, which you call immediately. And then you have parsed the, this value, put it in the registry. And then next time you can return that from the registry. The only issue with this is um, that I had to change the, what was it? I had to change some test. Uh, let me see in Git which one that was. Oh, Z test in general. Right, this had to change to add this allow IO. I hope this is more or less readable. Because if I don't do that, if we go to Z test and Split this across a few more lines. If we comment this out 
and then do Maven clean test. And I always have to do a clean test because Eclipse isn't set up correctly and compiles bad code. And eventually I'll have to fi figure out how to fix that. But um, right now it's still fast enough to just do a clean test instead of a test every time. Uh, so we get an error here because uh, security exception operation is not allowed for this file, whatever that is. And I don't understand why that is, because uh, this env already has these two functions, env.get, it has get internal truffle file and get public truffle file. And the difference is supposed to be that if I'm, if the program in the, in the guest language or the program that I'm evaluating gave me the path, and I have no idea if it's a trusted path or anything, then I should use get public travel file. And if I control the path myself, if it's a path into the standard library or something, then I'm supposed to use get internal travel file. And I thought the difference was that between those was that one of these, uh, the internal travel file is going to be allowed even if the context is not marked to allow IO, but apparently that's not the case because I, if I don't allow IO, then I still get these security exceptions here that the operation is not allowed for this path. And that was basically where I gave up. What was that? Um, well, you saw the date on June 13th. So a week ago, that was where I gave up and committed that to a work in progress branch and uh, went to do something else. Um, Let's see if I can figure this out, maybe. If you have any questions, now would be a good time to ask. Um, otherwise, I'll just try to see if I can solve this puzzle. It almost sounds like the path here is significant. It sounds like um, maybe I have to register somewhere what my standard library paths look like. Um, operation is not allowed for, let me see if I can find that in the Graal source code repository. Aha, there we go. Operation is not allowed, forbidden. Ah, okay. So this forbids every path that's not null. And that is called here, set current working directory. Okay, so that's a class that forbids everything and that is the invalid file system. Then there's a denied IO file system and that's it, okay. So I guess for some reason I have a denied IO file system. Well, that makes sense, but Shouldn't I still be allowed to read the um, to read my own standard library anyways? So this this is about allowing guest language to perform unrestricted I/O operations on host system. Yeah, I do not want to uh, allow that, but I do want to allow this internal truffle file. So that returns a truffle file from an internal file system context and it asks the internal file system context file system to parse the path. And this is, is that being assigned anywhere? So this starts out as a file system context. Okay, that's the only assignment to it. So the env starts with a file system context and an internal file system context, whatever those are. Well, they wrap a file system and an internal file system. So presumably I have to find out where this constructor is being called. New env. And that is, that is instrumentation handler. I'm not convinced that's the right one. Um, I 
Yeah, file system context is not the one we saw earlier. File system is the interesting one. Parse path, check access. Yeah. So that was here. And the one was the that was forbidden was the denied IO file system or the invalid file system. I'm just going to guess that it's the denied IO file system that we're seeing. Can I have the name please? There we go. No? There we go. Denied IO file system. Okay, that's only referenced in here. New no IO file system is the getter for that. Has no IO file system. Aha, a language home file system. Ah, yes, yes. This has a set of paths which are the language homes and then to check access, if it's in language home, then it checks a full IO, otherwise it returns this check access of the super class, which is the denied IO file. Okay, so yeah, somewhere I need to define these language homes. Um, now, where does that happen? Does that happen in Z language? Language, no. Git grab minus e language home. Ah, lots. There's a truffle change log. Truffle language get language home. Yes, that sounds good. Uh, to return the language directory. Deprecated. Uh huh. Language. Yes. Okay, so is there in the truffle language a get language home? Yes, and it's final. Okay. So uh, this corresponds to directory in which the jar file is located. No. Okay. That's. Is that really it? So what? Do I need to. But okay. So this is now a single language home, and it corresponds to the directory in which the jar file is located, which I think in our case is in language target jars. No, that's just truffle API jar. Classes. There's a bunch of classes. Let me just do this. Um, at the time that we ha get a parse request, we system out print line the get language home, which is a string. Clean test. So then we should see what the language home looks like. And presumably it expects the standard library to be somewhere below that directory, which makes sense. Okay, it's null. It's null. Okay. Why is the language home null? Because it's not run from a jar file. That's why, I guess. Um, Is there any kind of documentation in this git grab? There's uh, truffle, 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 truffle. Accessor source, file systems, language cache.
So, oops. Born ahead of time, compiled binaries, corresponds to the location of the language files in the default graphic and distribution layout, executable or shared library. And this one is, that's an abstract function. Uh, can I find the implementation of get language home? There's a home finder and default home finder. And test, test. There's a language cache. It's probably this home finder or the default home finder. Yeah, this is abstract. And the impl default home finder, get home folder, collect standalone homes. Uh huh. Mm. Language home is null right now, which is a shame. Does simple language fix this at all? Language home. No, language home doesn't occur in simple language. Uh, main Java com. Let me just edit their SL language and do the exact same print in parse, which I assume is going to be called in simple languages test as well. Do a Maven clean test. Might need to export Java Home first, but let's see. Compile this simple language. Probably didn't need to clean there, but eh, too late. Okay, yeah, okay, the language home is null for a simple language as well. So if I'm looking for any guidance, I need to look further because simple language does not have this problem. Let me just quickly close the window. I know it's the summer solstice and everything, but now it's still getting kind of dark outside and I don't need to see that. Uh, so I guess simple language just doesn't have a standard library that it needs to load. And what was the function I'm calling? Get internal truffle file. Yeah, that's not used in simple language at all. Um, it's surely used somewhere in here, right? Um, in the uh, sulong is a bit too much for me. No, Graal.js is a separate Git repository. JS, there we go. Oof, this takes ages. Okay, JS doesn't have get internal truffle file. Graal Python. Aha, Graal Python has it in tests and in source code. Great. Also, I can delete this argument names branch because it did not get merge the pull request. There's the grep. So the Python 3 core built in prefix dot suffix. Aha, language home even. Somewhere in the Python context. Um. Get internal truffle file. Uh, 
what does this do? So this is initialize home and prefix paths. Um, so it does a bunch of searching. It catches the security exception and ignores it. I like that. Uh, if it has a home, then blah, 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 blah. Okay, so in this case, it's just possible for the home to be null and they deal with it somehow. Um. Have a home plus home now, then home get path, otherwise, nope. And test. Oh. Uh, okay, so this is not a Maven project. What is this CI? Okay. Trying it. Bundled releases. I do not want to use the bundled releases. I want to know how I can build your project. Uh, okay. Is there anything useful in scripts? No idea. Okay, no, I think this is not going to work. If it's not a Maven project, then it, even if the language home here is something that's not going to tell me what I need to change to my test setup to get a language home. So, so the issue I need to solve, I guess, is that somewhere in the language POM XML, it describes somehow how Maven should test this thing. And I think that's somewhere here. Surefire is some Maven JUnit thing, I think. We're saying, please include all of these classes. We have some extra class path elements. We have Graal Python, Sulong, Sulong API. Uh, we disable a locator, whatever that means. And we have a test arc line, which I believe comes from somewhere up here. Operate a module path, whatever that means. More options, more options. And we add jars, whatever those are. Language target jars, but there's only the truffle API. Does that contain our code? No, it doesn't. Find language target, let's name jar. That's the only jar in there. Okay, so our own code is not loaded as a jar, as far as I can tell. Is there something in Graal that will let me set this home? So there's the set get language home. If I search that for set, the field is reset. Set language home property. That is probably not what I want. Then there's a bunch of reset and there's some loud motorcycle outside. Reset, 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 use truffle and reset. This is a set in the mathematical sense, not something that we can Set to a different value, reset, that's it. No. I suspect there's no way to overwrite the language home. Uh, which is annoying. What is this set language home property? It's a private method. Oh no, hello. 
Aha. So if we set this Java system property, does that override the home? And that's surely not going to be the perfect solution, but maybe it's good enough to make the tests pass. So presumably somewhere in the test arc line, I would need to add minus D or vm dot language dot Z is the ID dot home equals dot. Let's try that. Aha! Yes! And was the... Was this still there? It was, yes. If I remove the allow IO, does the test still pass? No. Damn it. Damn it! Uh, so the language home is, so we're still printing that, and it is now dot and not null. Maybe, I don't know, it needs to be abstract text. What was it? Abstract text slash, yeah. Maybe it needs to be that. No, still seven failures. Operation is not allowed for maybe it needs to be an absolute path. Um, project dot um, well, I just need to know whatever the Maven environment variable for the project working directory or something is maven project directory let me see if i can find that project dot base dir yeah that sounds good base dir and let's just do a maven test so it's faster because it shouldn't need to recompile anything Hello. So this all of a sudden turned into an absolute path, whereas up here it was still a relative path. So we're getting somewhere and now maybe the issue is that this POM XML file is the slash language subdirectory and Oh, oh, yes, yes, so the trick is, um, he explains to the two people who are still listening, um, the project setup here is a bit stupid. We have uh, POM XML in the root directory, and then there's language and launcher subprojects, and each of them has their own uh, POM XML, and the vast majority of the time, the language POM XML is the one we care about. But the thing is that this abstract text here is a Git submodule. And then, so that the tests work when they run from inside the language directory, in language, we have a symbolic link, abstract text, which links to the other abstract text. So if you just read, uh, if you're in language, uh, because when Maven runs this POM XML, it changes the current working directory there, I think. And if you're in there and read, um, uh, what is it? Um, I don't remember the net command, but if I read abstract text slash nh data z1.json, uh, then that still works, and abstract text here is actually a symbolic link. But I suspect that Java actually follows this symbolic link. That's why here the language component that's up there, it vanished. 
because it doesn't want to follow the symbolic link and actually well, it follows the symbolic link and then checks again, is it still allowed against whatever file system policy it has. And now we are outside of our language home, which is in slash language, and therefore it throws a security exception. And, well, uh, so that suggests if I add slash dot dot here, it's going to work. No? Um, probably because dot dot there doesn't work. Uh, I have a better idea anyways, which is unlink the abstract text here. Move abstract text into language and then link language abstract text here. So now I've just switched the symbolic links around, but now the real should never have to follow the symbolic link outside of the language subdirectory. So now this should work. And it's a very stupid solution, but... Ah, yes, it works. <laughs> okay. And if I use the... Um, if I do package, uh, so... Everything we've done so far is just use the test target, which runs the unit test. If you do the package target, then you also get in language target this graal in h.jar or the snapshot.jar. And that is used in this z launcher script. Uh, where is it? Here. And after, so after you do Maven package, you can also use this z script and put there some, some JSON like this. Um, and this is then going to run the code for you. So let me just try if, uh, what was all of this about? Uh, we wanted a Z1K1, the type is a Z7 function call, the Z7K1 function we want to call is Z36, I believe, and the K1 is Z28, which is the project name, so we call the value built in off the project name value, which, ouch. Um, okay, I made a typo in the JSON. That's, that's all. Rup. Z28. Mm. Oh, right, uh, because I never copied this define here to the launcher script, and it needs to be there as well. Something like this anyways, except without the project base there, because we don't have that. Instead, it's, uh, is it PWD or CWD? PWD, okay. So this, paste in the JSON again. Yes, there we go. It prints the value of the project name, which is thus this string, which means that now the launcher script works. Um, you can override this language home directory with this define, and that's good enough for now, which means I can remove the allow IO again, Remove this comment, remove this, remove this, let Eclipse collapse all of that into one line again. Remove that helpful print from that language as well. Uh, git add dot. Whatever this T is. So what was the difference since the work in progress commit? The submodule moved path. Uh, the symlink changed, the submodule moved, we added this uh, minus D, the language home, we added, we removed the allow IO again, and the to do as well, and we added the minus D here, and that was all we needed, and all the rest already worked in the work in progress commit, which I can now amend. Uh, add function call implementations. 
I don't remember how many how many tests for them I had written already. Uh, oh, and also this enable sessions can go away again. I don't need that. Well, let's mark this still as work in progress. Um, not really tested yet, but seems to work reasonably well. Though we need to set the language home and the language and the source files we load need to below the language home and we're not allowed to hide that behind syntax either. So we need to swap the abstract text sub module, module and symlink so that the real abstract text data is properly below the language below language, which is a language home when running the unit tests, see the minus d in the language pom.xml. Okay. So that doesn't do that much. Updates the POM XML here to add this minus D. It adds the implementation function call node, which creates a tall target for the current node you have. Um, and there's just a bit more um, truffle trickery here, which is that we say this call target is, it's not actually final in the Java sense, but it's final at compilation time. And if we ever need to reassign it, which you only need to do once here, then we tell the compiler, if you're currently in compiled code, then step out back into interpret uh, interpreter mode and invalidate all the I'm not sure exactly which assumptions, but invalidate something. And that includes this compilation final, um, because now we're actually assigning to it. And then we create this call target, and then we return it. And because we've marked this as a compilation final, I assume that in compiled code, this if here never runs. So this should only run in interpreted mode, I assume. And basically in in compiled mode, this get call target whole function here should be as cheap as it can possibly be. Um, yeah, what else was in there? Uh, right, a reference literal node needs to now pass the context into the Z reference that it creates. And right now I do this with this lookup context reference and there's a cached context annotation, which sounds promising and I haven't yet figured out if I can use it. Uh, so to do for now. Uh, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I can remove this by now. Z root node. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying to make this work somehow. So let's remove this is adoptable. Even clean test and hope that the tests still pass, which would mean that this was indeed completely unnecessary. Yep, that looks good. Great. Uh, the JSON parser learns to parse a function call as this kind of implementation. And there's again something where we have to create a root node, but we have no idea where we get a language from. And for now the language is null. Uh, the context has this helper method to get a truffle file and a Z reference is completely reworked. And instead of doing this ugly thing where it calls the JSON parser itself and calls the execute method itself, uh, it instead 
ask Truffle, would you please parse this source code for us and then execute it? And that seems to be a better thing to do. And we also have to set the language home. And now one thing that should be possible is to go into the code.js test and instead of using this fake NAND here, uh, which only has a JS implementation, we should be able to return the real, uh, what is it, Z53 I believe? Z54 is true, 55 is false, 53 is NAND, yeah, 53. And then it's going to run, uh, it's going to load the real Z53 with its three or four or five implementations, I think, from disk and run that. Which should still work. No. message not supported context reference was used from an engine that is currently not entered. Context reference must not be shared between multiple engine instances. I see. Okay, so it's not as simple as I thought. Uh, let me get rid of this. No, actually, let me get it back, but also tell the parser, where is it, there, uh, parse implementation, that actually it has no idea how to parse a function call. Never heard of such a thing. Because then it's instead going to fall back to this thing where it just throws an unusable implementation exception and then it should fall through from those code implement no from those function call implementations to the code implementation that this test is actually about does that work it does not but it's a different error. Invalid sharing of runtime values in AST node detected. Stack trace and the full output Maven helpfully hides from us. And instead we have to go to language, target, surefire reports, DE, Lucas Werkmeister, test, code, J, JS test. There we go. Exclusive JS, okay, long stack trace, long stack trace, long stack trace. Even more stack traces. Sheesh. Okay. So it's not fully working yet. And I'm not sure why, but I will have to look into that some other time. I think it's time for me to stop here. So I will reset that, put it away, amend this. Doesn't seem to quite work yet. Existing tests pass. Uh, but running a um, function call implementation seems to fail. And I think, no. Wait, I'm confused. So a code implementation worked earlier on this commit, but then when I switch this to the real Z54, even if I haven't taught the parser how to parse this new implementation type, it still fails. Why does it fail? Shouldn't... Hmm. Okay, I don't understand. 
but I will leave this note here and also call the branch function call and delete the whip branch. I think doesn't git branch. Yeah, git branch is a move operation nowadays, which I should use instead of that, but too late. Um, I think that's it from me. Yeah, I hope the first part of this was a more or less helpful overview of how Dral in H works in general, uh, some of the aspects of it. And I will just keep working on it and maybe once it works better I will make another video like this, I don't know. Because if we ever end up using this crazy thing then presumably some foundation employees and other smart people will want to work on the code base as well and uh, just like me they will probably not be very familiar with Graal before but unlike me they will not have had the learning experience of writing this either so yeah but yeah I think that's it for me from now let's see where this experiment goes thanks a lot for hanging out and uh, insightful comments, including this uh, one that I should definitely do about uh, Z23 being the null object and not Z13. Yeah, then have a nice evening. See you.